Hello, everybody. Um, as, as opposed to what appears to be most people on this list, uh, we're from a mid-size or small company relative to a lot of these very small companies. And I think there's a different risk profile in large companies versus small. Um, small, we have to stay alive. We have to find customers that want to buy what we have today, learn from those lessons, and then move forward. And with working with government partners and also academic partners, that brings a longevity and that long-term view while we still bring it into what we have to do today. What I'm going to explain today is some of the things that we've had to do and the customers we've had to find that exist today while we continue on those very large markets in the future where I think there will going to be a lot of convergence. Our base product is the bioharness. The bioharness is fabric-based. Um, the, 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 the initial start of this was putting it onto Special Forces soldiers who don't like gel patches, actually don't like anything except their guns. And so we had to make it extremely comfortable. So very quickly we had to look at all the things around the technology, the deployment and so forth, that actually made it useful. We also had to have the folks at Natick and the other academics accept that what we were measuring was valid, so we had to go and get FDA. And then we had to turn into actionable data. And then we had to get it somewhere else. So because we rely on PSM being valuable, typically it's valuable to the, not only the person wearing it, but somewhere else. And so the BAN, which we use Bluetooth, secure Bluetooth and other short range radios, typically have to connect to an internet, which typically means a long range radio or a bridge. And in some cases, for example, NetWarrior, um, that is the US Army's um, PSM, or they're putting PSM into NetWarrior, we're actually using a fiber optic link into their hub because detectability and susceptibility to, to, for instance, jamming and letting off IEDs, there is a zero tolerance to um, short range radio at this point in time. So our view of um, where the future is going is all these devices are effectively in the internet. And as long as the internet is not storing it and it's an FDA approved server, then the internet is just a comms channel. And I think we've already had very, very good examples of why we can use that um, to today. And so when we start connecting up to people, we have to decide what, are they, what do they already have? Because hassle factor is a huge driver to compliance here. And we can all sit here in this conference and think it's great, but if someone doesn't know, they can actually touch their Android screen to turn it on, which is a case we've had in field trials with nurses. Um, and they're already carrying something, we have to use what they already have. So for our healthcare and consumer devices, we use smartphones. We love Android, it's open, um, it's very easy. We're about to be on iPhone because um, when it comes to compliance, it, it looks like most people with iPhones care more about their lifestyle than Android, so there's very interesting demographic choices there. And, and with um, tactical radios such as, such as Phaser, D8, uh, first responders and soldiers, they already have voice radios. And what's, what's very important about these voice radios is the high power. They can punch out to the guy at the other end and they own the bandwidth. And I think who owns the bandwidth is incredibly important for a lot of these applications, not just for the ban, but also for the long range comms. Here is a um, non-internet, non-cell phone um, view of the world. This is what we do in, uh, for, for defence. So we've got the soldier, he has to, he has to view his own data. But what, what he sees is very different to what his commander wants to see. Then you move along to his squad commander. He wants to know where are his soldiers, so he needs a map. So the main interface is a map with a simple red, orange, green status on the map. Then you go to the medic. Well, at the moment, a medic wants to know, should I go forward? Because typically you get injured when there's bullets flying around, so it's a good time to make a choice. The medic at the moment um, from Medivac, the AFSOC guys that come in, they have no view of the person until he actually is dumped on a helicopter. With our system, he's actually seeing that data as he comes in. So that person he's, he's looking after, he's actually seeing that trend um, from injury all the way up to care. For an IED blast, there's not a golden hour, there's a golden 20 minutes. So it's very, very critical that he does the right things very quickly, such that the guys actually come back as a good um, husband, father, and member of society once he comes back and leaves the forces. Then obviously the local commander, the FOB field hospital and HQ have a lot of other data. And you can see from there, we have different ban um, opportunities there, and then we have different range going from left to right and different technologies that, that allow that to happen. And all this integration and all this data really matters. For instance, with Land Warrior, we had 30 bytes to sneak into the GPS track. So we had to tell somebody, 
or a remote commander, somebody's okay, they're up, they're down, they're moving, they potentially have dehydration or heat stroke, they're in shock with only 30 bites once a minute. Um, it's quite a challenge. We do a lot of um, concept of operation analysis in Zephyr, generally because we're at the bleeding edge of getting this into early adopters, and if we don't tell them how we think they could use it, the conversation doesn't start, how will they use it? And the, um, the magic word in defence is requirement. Until there's a requirement, there's no budget to buy it. So um, without a concept of operation, you don't get a requirement. So we get involved with requirements and concepts of operation very early. So yeah, this is a, um, this is quite a, I say fun, I hope that's not too morbid, um, a concepts of operation here for what the special forces use it for. Um, here you can see the guys are quick rope down from the helicopter. These guys are going to, to attack this village here, but they set someone up here to actually give oversight, call in friendly fire, look after the jets, maybe he's a sniper. If this guy, if this guy at number four goes down, you want to know, because you may not run across that field because you don't quite have the protection that you need. Very, very simple real-time information to the local commander, but absolutely change, changes the outcome of the mission. And this is, this is retold for first responders, for guys in hazmat suits, for firefighters, um, and for, and for um, just normal consumers with their health care. Some examples of very simple um, PSM for the first responder. Um, a classic I like because it's just so simple for us to do as technologists. If you're upside down and you're a firefighter, it's generally bad always. We don't need high level algorithms to tell a commander who's on scene, someone's upside down, he needs help straight away. First responders have a device that if they don't wriggle every 30 seconds actually makes a very loud sound. It lets the other guys come and find him and smoke. Because we know that if he's a firefighter and he's stationary, it's bad. We should let his command know straight away. So these are some examples of the technologies there now. We get across his Motorola radio right now. The accelerometry is very, very standard and it can make a huge difference to the mission and to safety. Obviously, as you go further down, um, it gets a little bit more complicated. The sensors increase, the workflow increases, and, and everything gets a little bit harder. This is the final slide because we're um, under a lot of uh, time pressure this morning to get done. These are the 12 main things we look at for success in technology. And the ones at Zephyr we really focus on are the green ones because we're on people. And we're on people that have a job to do, or a fitness enthusiast, or someone not with a chronic illness but wants to stay fairly healthy. Um, people in their 40s we find a very, very good demographic. They're busy, they've got family, they're not doing the sports they think they used to do, and they know their, their longevity and, and the, their quality of life depends on them doing some level of fitness right now. So we actually believe the fitness and the medical communities are converging, and we believe wellness is actually where we're going with all this technology. So I don't think it's just um, stuff inside your body. I think it's stuff that can stop you needing stuff inside your body that's very important, and we believe that's where the market's growing very rapidly. Less FDA as well, which means we get to market faster. So fashion and comfort's very important for a lot of these things. I say <coughs> ladies like to look nice, but guys don't want to look stupid. So if, if, you, if you're going to put something on a person, make sure you meet some basic rules. Otherwise, no matter how good the technology is, it's not going to be adopted. There's an entanglement risk. Um, with the first responders and soldiers we deal with, you know, there's a lot of wires and so forth comes out. It looks great until you have to go through a tunnel and you get snagged up. The guy's not going to wear that technology ever again. And then donning and doffing, which is the uh, garment phrase for putting your clothes on and off, um, it has to be easy. You know, we have shirts now that you just put the shirt on and the firefighters love it because they don't have a, an extra step to do. So compliance at the personal level I think is the place to start. If you make this low hassle and value very, very high, then the technology will be adopted. If you don't address these things very early on, it's going to stay in the lab. I think performance has been really well covered in this panel, so I'll, um, I won't touch on that. I think workflow is incredibly impl important. Things like how do I charge the batteries? How do I deploy? A firefighter has to get out of the fire station with 30 seconds of the alarm going off. He puts his boots on, pulls his pants up and gets into the um, uh, fire truck. You can't add, oh, and by the way, unplug this from the recharger, oh, and click this into my shirt, and then, oh, okay, I'm up, oh, hang on, Fred's not up, let him get connected. That has to happen seamlessly. He can't have batteries going flat. So the deployment's very, very important. 
Training load, I think, is one of the biggest things that are missed in, in most um, technologies. Training load for the person. We have a strap that I think is pretty obvious you put here because the heart rate signal is here, and as long as the snaps are touching the right place, you get heart rate. We've had it put here. We've put it around backwards. It's amazing what people do because they don't do what we do every day. So that training load is very important. And I think for the medical community and the commanders making the decisions based on this data, it's also very, very important. So we've done a lot of good work with NASA over the years. They've taken us up in the zero gravity um, flight. They worked with us for the Chilean miners. What they've taught us is there's lots of things we could measure, but for the last two or 300 years, the medical profession has learned how to use certain measures. As Zephyr, we're not going to teach a doctor to use another cool way to measure blood pressure. We'll give it to him in blood pressure. So his training load is zero. He knows how to use blood pressure. He knows how to use resting heart rate. And I think it's very important as we try to bring new technology, we don't want to bring new measures because then we have to train the entire industry that's going to use it and generate value from it. At least we're not as a startup. And I think the organisation, the situation awareness, I think is an obvious one. Cost savings and standards, I think, has been covered very, very well here. This is um, the last slide. This is very, very simple, just to get across a few points. Um, we've taken this from the economists, so they, they look at value in dollars and so forth. We look at value analysis or hassle factor versus value of our technology to our users. And we take everything on this slide and we give a value to it and then we decide whether it's cold or hot based on is it going to be hassle or is it going to be value to the, to the user. For example, ISM radio. It's great, it's very easy to implement in the lab. Everyone else is using that channel. The chances are that you're not going to get a reliable signal when you need it. Uh, for instance, we did the NFL Combine um, this year on Bluetooth across Lucas Oilfield. We had to make sure Wi-Fi hotspots were turned off. There were a lot of hot Wi-Fi hotspots when you've got 10,000 people watching. Um, Bluetooth to APCO radios, that's the state of the art for Zephyr today. So there's a national standard, APCO radios. Everyone, the first responders own the bandwidth in their local county. Motorola has 90% market share, so we've partnered with them because it's easy. We can get on 90% of first responders right now, that's nice. We've added a secure Bluetooth radio chip um, that goes on the side of their radio, so they don't have to carry an extra radio. And what's very important is the guys are already trained. When the voice goes out, they know the radio's out of range. So our data goes out when voice goes out. They're not blaming us that we're any worse, and they're already trained to know big steel building, no radio comms. So there's a lot, there's a lot of really good things about that. Getting, getting a full system deployed over an APCO radio, you need a comms officer and you need a large organisation. So the deployment speed is very slow for us. Our next generation devices have got cellular chips in them. We're working with Qualcomm and AT&T. It's just connected. So when the sensor's just connected, we don't need any other infrastructure as long as there's cell phone there. As soon as I mention this, everyone knows a particular house or an auntie's house where they don't have AT&T, so it may not work if their house is on fire. So there's no perfect examples here, but all we can do is try to get better and better. Thank you.